Thank you all for joining us for today's presentation, What's New from PDC, Windows Azure, presented by David Coleman. My name is Meredith Mead, and I'm the Marketing Coordinator for Nudesic and the moderator for today's webcast. This webcast is presented by David Coleman, Nudesic's General Manager of the Custom Application Development Practice. If you're all logged on, you should be able to see, see the slide that states Nudesic. There was a brief intro earlier regarding the features within live meeting. To briefly recap, we encourage you to ask questions throughout the session by typing them in. To ask a question, click on the Q&A verbiage located in the toolbar on the top left side of your screen. Type your question, then click the Ask, ask button. Please note all questions will be held until the end. We will also be using the Scene Chart feature within Live Meeting. Changing your feedback color within this tool provides feedback to the presenter. To provide feedback, click on the Feedback menu from the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Select your feedback color. Your seat in the comments center will display your selected color. Lastly, this webcast is being recorded and will be available via the Nudesic website. We will email you when the link is available. Before I turn it over to David, we are interested to hear about how you heard about this webcast. We want to do a quick polling question before we start. So if you could please select one of the options that we have up. We greatly appreciate the feedback. Let's give it a few more seconds for everybody. Great. Thank you, everyone. We really appreciate it. At this time, I'd like to turn the presentation over to David. Thank you. Let me just share my desktop here, and we'll get started. Okay, well, welcome, everybody. My name is David Pullman. I am the uh, general manager of the custom app to practice in Gesic. Gesic is Microsoft National SI partner. And uh, I'm very involved with leading our cloud efforts around Windows Azure, uh, which for me is the most exciting technology I've ever been involved with. And this is the first in a series of webcasts where we're going to go over uh, all the great new things that Microsoft has just released for Windows Azure. So our timeline of what's been going on with Windows Azure is uh, Windows Azure was announced and it went into a preview period back in uh, fall 2008 at, at September 50 City 2008. So we had about 60 months to play with it. And it went early this year in 2010 to a commercial release, and that was fantastic. And so really the first release that everybody started using it was called the 1.1 release. And about middle of the year, right around the time of the Worldwide Partner Conference, uh, June, July, time frame, we got the 1.2 update where we got some new uh, features capabilities. But the big news is what just came out uh, literally this week, which is the 1.3 release. That was uh, a release that is just packed with new features. Uh, uh, Microsoft, would have been, in my opinion, would have justified in calling this a 2.0 release. In fact, there's so many new features in it. So the purpose of these three webcasts is to go through these. And uh, we also heard about some great features coming in 2011 that we're excited about. So uh, what we'll do in these three webcasts is we're going to go over some of the features today and some of the next webcasts. Uh, today we're going to focus on the Windows Azure features, and then subsequent to webcasts we will get into the uh, SQL Azure area and the App Fabric area updates. So we see here highlighted the ones that we'll, we'll, we'll talk about all of them. So the ones that are highlighted here are the ones we'll go into a little more deeply, and we'll, de we'll demonstrate some of them to you. So as I said, the update's called 1.3, and uh, so that not only means new functionality coming in line, but it means there's a new SDK. Um, now, the thing you need a little bit of a scorecard for on these new features is that some of them are available release, and some of them are available but through a C2B, Community Technology Preview Program, you have to sign up for. So um, that's pretty evident because then you use the portal if, uh, and you get to an area that's not, not open for general availability, you just see a message about it and I'll put a link to, uh, to sign up. Uh, there is a compatibility note I want to give you about the 1.3 SDK. So if you're doing new development with Azure, you don't really have anything in production, this is not even anything to be too concerned about, but if you have existing things running on the earlier 1.2 SDK, uh, you do want to be aware that a few things are different. Um, in particular, I'll refer you to the, uh, the Windows Azure Storage Team blog, where they've mentioned some changes here that people should be aware of. Um, so 
every release, Microsoft looks at uh, uh, how good the APIs are and the features, and uh, occasionally they see you need to refactor that. And occasionally that refactoring is that's what we call a breaking change. Or sometimes it's just a bug that isn't worth uh, holding up the release, but we don't want people to know about. So on this, on this page here from the Windows Azure Storage Team blog, you will see uh, a number of those relating to storage that so you probably want to be aware of. Again, if you're if you're running something in production 1.2, you probably want to uh, to review this see if any of it affects you uh, before you jump in there. Also, I'll mention that if you have an existing uh, Windows Azure solution and you can download the SDK, which of course includes Visual Studio Tools update as well. Uh, it will convert your project, and we'll go through that conversion process to convert it to 1.3 format, uh, of course, saving off the old stuff. But just be aware that it does that, and so you may want to, again, if you're uh, running something in production, you probably want to just keep a, a safe copy of what you have there, and uh, if you do an upgrade to 1.3, just, just test everything and make sure you're, uh, you're in a good situation. You don't want any surprises. There are a couple other things about the 1.3 SDK. Uh, there is some renaming going on. So uh, we're, we're used to considering the uh, the cloud uh, simulator that you find on your desktop as what we call the dev fabric and dev storage. And those now have been renamed to the compute emulator and the storage emulator. And you can see in my uh, system tray down here where I have the uh, the blue Windows Azure icon. Uh, if I right click it, then now it's called compute emulator and uh, the storage emulator. No different than how they work, it's just different names. So let's get into some of the new stuff. Uh, one of the things that's a big feature in PhoneWrite, but also is an enabler for a lot of the other features, is a new Windows Azure portal. And new portal is uh, it's more polished, it's more capable, it shows a lot more information. I think it's more intuitive to use. Uh, it's kind of similar to Outlook in this layout. We'll show you this in a minute. One big thing about it is it supports co-administrators. So if you're familiar with the Windows Azure portal experience from Azure up to now, you set up a, a Windows Live ID, which you associate with a billing account, and that, when you get to the portal, you that's how you get to the portal, and that lets you do everything. <laughs> well, ultimately, we want the cloud to be a place where we can have multiple administrators doing things, and uh, you know, eventually down the road have things like granular security and role-based permissions. So the first step to that is can we have more than one Live ID administering the same account? So one of the features we have in the new portal is that it supports co-administrators. So you can have additional Live IDs now that you uh, enable to authorize to be administrators. So that's uh, that's a big help right there. Good first step towards uh, towards more role-based security and such. Uh, the new portal also gives you actions for hosted services. And these are very exciting to me. Uh, reboot, reimage, and connect by remote desktop. Uh, remote desktop in particular, we'll talk about a little bit later on. But that means for any of your instances, you can reboot them, you can reimage them, meaning you set them back to their starting condition in terms of the VM, or, uh, or, uh, or connect to them. Now, the new portal, as we'll see in a minute, is uh, so it's well done, but it can seem a little intimidating just because it does so much and it's new and different. Uh, so the old portal is still available. You can actually uh, switch between the old and new portal and for a time, and so that's uh, that's a way of uh, you know, option to rush back to a familiar place if you need to. So here's what the new portal looks like, and we'll go to it live in a second here. Uh, as I said, it's outlook like. So at the bottom left, you have this, these bands of categories. When you when you pick a category, you'll get a set of uh, subcategories on the top left. When you pick a subcategory, you'll get in this middle main area a list of items in a hierarchy. So that would be things like, for example, for hosted services, that will be things like my uh, my my cloud services, and within them there are roles, within them there are instances. And you can kind of collapse this, and you get a certain amount of status information there. But if you click on a particular item in the hierarchy, for example, uh, a role or an instance, then at right in this properties window, you'll get the actual item detail. So it's, uh, it's pretty intuitive to use and consistent. Uh, one of the things about the old portal was uh, it was reasonable, but the uh, the areas for the different you know, for Windows Azure Compute as opposed to storage, but those things were, were, were pretty different looking. Uh, and here it's more of a consistent experience. When you do select an item at the top there in the toolbar, you have different items that are appropriate, allowable for that for that item. So in your notes, let's talk, let's actually see it. So my browser in full screen mode, so I'm at a low resolution. So you start picking on Azure.com. And uh, one thing you'll notice in Azure.com, and you may have noticed in the last month or so, is that it's got a, a new look uh, in general, and uh, that uh, right there on the main page, the new features are being talked about. 
So there's, there's plenty of direct information about the features we're talking about this morning uh, that you can you can go see right there on site, as well as sign up for some of the ones that are uh, that require CPPs. So as of the past, to get to the portal, you click accounts and pick up the portal area you want to start with. So I'll go to one of those Azure Developer Portal. And there we are. And just bear with you for a second here so I can go into full screen mode. I think I have a different window to open. Uh, that's better. So uh, one of the first things to notice about the new portal is it starts out with help. So uh, I mentioned we have these categories in the bottom left, and home is where you start, and there's a lot of information here and more to come about how do I do things, how do I do basic tasks, how do I get started, and such. So that's, uh, that's good to see. We have getting started area. We have common tasks that you can do, so just how to deploy and all of that, uh, help and support, how to get help, and then for the various beta programs, how to sign up and, uh, and get on these CPPs. So the next category down is hosted services and storage accounts, CDN, basically the Windows Azure subset of the, uh, of the platform. So here you get sort of an overall roll-up. It shows me my uh, number of subscriptions I have, number of uh, production deployments, and such. It's uh, just kind of a roll-up of, uh, of my detail. Uh, I can look at my affinity groups, which, as you may recall, allows me to set uh, uh, names for groups so I can have multiple projects that uh, – they have to be in the same data center. That's nothing new about that. I have place your management certificates. Management certificates are the certificates you upload if you want to use, for example, the service management API to prog programmatically work with uh, Windows Azure management. Hosted services, though, is the place that most people think about when they go to the portal, and that is where your uh, compute instances live. So you can see here I have several uh, different uh, things going on here. And if I, uh, if I collapse this a little bit, you'll see that I have uh, I have three cloud services. Here's one called My Simple Website. And again, if I, I'm getting quite a bit of information about these things on the right here. So I can see, for example, when I, when I created this thing, I can see which data center it's in. It's in the Texas data center. As I expand it, I, uh, I have areas for my certificates. Now I might have certificates, for example, because I'm doing um, HTTPS connections. I have my... Uh, Role. So here I have a web role, and, and I can see underneath that that I have two instances. And so, again, I can uh, get quite a bit of information just by, by scrolling through them here. As I've been doing this, you'll notice that the uh, commands up, up top on the uh, toolbar are changing to, to tell me what's allowable. So for storage accounts, uh, as in the past, you have your, your primary and secondary keys and ability to regenerate them. Uh, they are no longer shown by default, so uh, sensitive information like keys you have, you have to summon, and that's just a, just a good practice in case there are the people standing looking over your shoulder and such. So I'm not, I'm not going to go too much into the database reporting side of the portal or the service bus part because we are going to be doing more of that when we have the next uh, series in this, uh, in this webcast series. We're going to stay focused on what is Azure right now. So user management is my ability here to uh, set up different uh, different users for my uh, for my account. And the VM images has to do with this new new uh, feature called uh, VM role. And you see, that I can't get to it yet. This is one of the, VM role is one of these. Uh, features you have to sign up for and get into a CTP program. So uh, VMworld is one of the ones that we're going to show in one of the subscribe webcasts because we don't have the ability to demo it today. But all of the other Windows Azure features we are going to uh, talk about and, and be able to demo most of them right now. So there you have it on the new portal. Um, good experience. But again, if you had any uh, concern about this or you weren't quite ready for it, you notice that here at the bottom, take me back to the old portal. You can revert right back. You can switch right back to the old portal and tell me want to go back and forth. Okay, so another uh, another very useful feature is uh, 
It's called admin mode slash startup tasks. And what this is all about is up till now, it's been very easy to take an application, say something you do in Visual Studio, like an ASP.NET website, web service, a light application, fast program, and uh, push that up into the cloud and have it run. And uh, it's always the question of well, what about third-party software I'm using? Well, one category that has a bit of problem, let's say I buy some controls for uh, for my website. Well, that's fine. If it builds your solution, as long as these assemblies are included, uh, they get packaged up, you put them in the cloud, and you're fine. But what if you need to actually do something a little more deeper? Let's say you need something that requires admin mode access, such as installing a third-party software package, you know, actually running an MSI, or updating the registry, or registering a COM component. These are things that have been uh, pretty hard to do up till now. Uh, in some cases, people have been creative and found found ways to do that. Uh, but in some cases, they have been able to, and certainly it hasn't been very, even if possible, it hasn't been very approachable for most people. So this feature is something to solve that. And the idea here is that when you uh, deploy a package with your definition and configuration for your cloud service for when it's actually deploy, that you can also now tell it, hey, I've got some things for you to do in this late, at, at startup time or before I start up. The way this works is in your cloud service definition, in your, that XML, you, you can simply define the task you want to run. And you have the option of saying these tasks are going to run before your role starts or in parallel to your role starting. There are a couple of different types of uh, startup tasks and, and, and uh, user modes you can specify here. So this is kind of how it looks. You are, uh, you're in your application's uh, cloud service definition, and you can add a startup area where you can list one or more tasks. And for each task, you have some kind of command execute. It's unusual to use a batch or command file. Uh, the level of, of uh, user is going to run as, and the uh, the type of task. I'll explain what those are in a minute. Uh, and then you've got this command or command file to execute. So, for example, here's how you might register a uh, legacy com component. So this is an important feature because a lot of people think of the uh, the uh, the VM role feature as the way they would install third-party software. Uh, but VM role is a pretty drastic thing. It's it's uh, it's leaving the platform and the service world, going more to the infrastructure and service world. Uh, and you give up a lot of things that go into Apache. So before you uh, throw out the baby with the bathwater, uh, if you've been considering the VM role feature, but your main interest, main reason for doing so is simply that you need to install software, this is probably the uh, the high road for you. Uh, the only scenario where this admin mode and startup tasks aren't going to work for you is if your installation requires uh, a lot of uh, interaction, or if it's really long running, then perhaps uh, uh, the, you might be forced into the VM role context. But, uh, this is definitely where you should, uh, should be your starting point to try to use this feature. This works again with both web and worker roles. So I mentioned that there is, you can set the type of user and the type of task. The types of users are either limited or elevated. Elevated basically means you're running as an administrator. And the start of tasks, uh, the three types you can specify. A simple task is do the task and, uh, and, and wait for it to complete before you move on to the other tasks. Uh, so basically, do them up front before the roll starts. The other two options, though, let you uh, kick off this, these one, these one more tasks to run asynchronously. They don't hold up the starting up of your roll. Uh, and they're called background and foreground. Uh, this may not be super intuitive, so let me explain what that means. Uh, the background setting means uh, fire up the task in, uh, in parallel, and the roll just goes and runs, and that's the end of it. Uh, the foreground option means yet also asynchronously kick off these startup tasks in parallel to the role starting, but the role is not allowed to stop to be shut down until all of those tasks have completed running. So uh, if you were running something that was uh, in these startup tasks that was very important to complete and you didn't want the role to be shut down maybe for a patch or something uh, until that was um, until the tasks were finished, then you would use the background setting. So let's just show you what that looks like. I have a uh, simple ASP.NET Azure application here. Well, that are just chart of tasks, which does very little, and put up a page. And but I've got uh, some startup tasks to find. That's right here. I'm basically saying, hey, I want you to execute startup the command. It's a we'll run elevated, and it's a background task. I mean, you can run in parallel. Then I kind of blocking or waiting. And uh, so what is that going to do? Well, um, in real life, I'm going to install some piece of software, register a comp phone or something like that. In my case, I just have it very simply doing a file copy. I've got a file on the text, and uh, if this works like it's supposed to, then I should get a copy file to the text 
which does not currently exist. So aside from putting the startup XML, I'm not doing anything different. I'm going to hit a five to start my Azure application. So it use to its usual startup. Setting up the uh, compute emulator as it's called now. There's my page. Third thing was normal. Did it perform the startup tasks? Let's find out. So you can see file two of the text is there now. It, is, it, has, uh, it has executed those, that startup task. So very simple to use, uh, but very powerful because it gives us the ability now to have uh, uh, these installations or the environmental changes we need in place uh, with our deployments. So uh, very important in the future. Remote desktop. So this is also a huge feature. In the past, we have had this, uh, from a distance, this is the cloud, I guess is the way I'll put it. We learn about the cloud. We have the local, the local emulator to, uh, to get a feel for it. Uh, we're supposed to do a lot, as much local development tests as we can to feel that we have things right. We ultimately put things in the cloud, and if there's a problem or things don't work right or we want to see what's going on, it's been uh, an indirect approach to uh, to know what's going on there. We've got things like tracing diagnostics. We can instrument our applications to tell us things. Um, but still, the experience has been a little lacking as compared to what you could do in the enterprise or traditional hosting, where you can just connect directly to your machines and uh, see what's going on, which, if nothing else, for troubleshooting is a, is a, is a, is a major thing. So now we can do that. Uh, we have the capability. That's, that's, uh, that's going to make a real difference in uh, how, how quickly people can debug uh, cloud issues. So to do this, so that's anybody, of course, in remote desktop, so you've got to upload a certificate to the portal. And then when you're ready to publish your application uh, at a Visual Studio, typically, uh, that's where you, in that dialog, as I'll show you in a minute, that's where you configure the uh, remote desktop. Now, for VMs in, uh, in Windows Azure, it's true of the, the web worker VMs as well as the, uh, the new VM role feature, uh, you don't get, you're not allowed to access the administrator ID. So you've got to set up another, uh, another user uh, name and password. And, uh, that you're used to connect with. Also, uh, don't, you only allow a couple simultaneous RD connections, uh, I think two probably, and so uh, you don't want to get the idea that you can somehow use this feature as a, a terminal server or anything like that. It's, it's not meant for that. Well, let's check it out. First of all, to, let me set up my previous demo here. So first of all, to enable this feature, you start by uh, by doing a, a publish, just like you would to put your your deploy your application to the cloud. And you notice that uh, with the 1.3 SDK and tools, you have this new option here to configure remote desktop connections. This is how you set it up. So you click that, and uh, so the first question is that you're going to enable connections for all of the roles. Um, your solution might have more than one role, and you don't have to uh, open Pandora's box here and make everything connectable. You do have to have a, a certificate, so it'll it'll uh, it'll just select from your existing certificates to uh, to put a certificate there, which you also need to upload to the cloud to the manager portal. And you get to pick for yourself a username and a password you want to use for the remote desktop user. And you can also uh, set an expiration, so it doesn't necessarily have to uh, to be an ongoing uh, capability. Uh, then you go you go ahead and publish, which I won't do now because it's 20 minutes. Uh, but I've already done it previously, so. Let me go back to our Azure Manager portal here. Back to hosted services. Now, if you look up here in the uh, toolbar of the, of the portal, you notice that the very rightmost is this uh, connect option. You also notice as I click around that that option isn't always enabled. The reason it's not enabled uh, right here for my uh, production instances is that I, uh, I hadn't set up remote desktop when I published that. But when I went to deploy my uh, my staging copy here, I did go through that setup, and I did authorize the remote desktop, and so now I can use that feature. So here we go, remote desktop for the first time to uh, Windows Azure instance. Click Connect. When you click Connect, you're going to get a, a, a remote desktop and RDP file to, uh, to open, which you could also save off. And you will allow it, and you'll connect. And you'll need to supply whatever 
Financial, you had said in that Visual Studio published dialogue. If I recall, is this? Okay, there we are. We're actually on a Windows Azure Compute Instance. It's very exciting. And now that we can hear, we can poke around a little bit. So you may be curious about how these machines are really set up. Well, one thing you can do is you can just look, you can notice, for example, that uh, your computer, your VM image has three drives. One of those drives is for the, uh, what they call the guest OS image, the operating system that the virtual machine is running. And one is for um, local storage. And so it's kind of interesting to get more of an inside view about what's going on here. So we will uh, come back to this in a, in, a, in a minute here. I am actually uh, struggling with how to get to the uh, remote desktop header that's being hidden by live meeting. I actually can't dismiss this. Well, I think I'll just have to log off. That'll dismiss it. So. I could also leave my uh, my connection open for next time. My choice. It's just a regular remote desktop. Okay. So full IIS. So previously, uh, a web role uh, ran something called hosted web core. It wasn't really full IIS. It was very much locked down, uh, and you had no way to use and you had no remote desktop. You had no way to use IIS configuration manager. Uh, so as a result, uh, certain actions that you might consider routine in the enterprise were just unavailable or, or very difficult in the cloud. Uh, so a good example of that would be multiple virtual directories uh, for your web application. Uh, that's kind of important for a couple of reasons. First of all, some people's applications are structured that way. So they might have a different virtual directory for the web services, for example, as compared to the other parts of their application. Also, from a, you know, from a standpoint of uh, uh, Affordability, does the pricing model work? Some people would like to run more than one application in the same web role farm and, and one is Azure, and that's been hard to do. But with full IS now, that's not so hard to do. And so we uh, many, many, many more scenarios for uh, for shared operation are, are enabled by this by this feature. As well as all this, just many of the IS features that you may have, maybe have wanted to get at, but they were kind of denied to you up to now were there. So uh, lots of new possibilities there. Uh, for example, in the uh, in the upcoming la uh, revised labs for um, Windows Azure Platform Training Kit, you'll see that uh, the, the labs allow you to set uh, you know, three different websites through a binding uh, for the same for the same web role. So you'll soon be able to get some hands-on experience with what I'm talking about. Okay, so to demo this, I need to go back into my. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna remote desktop back to where we were a minute ago. Okay, here we are. So again, now that I'm on the box, I can uh, I can do pretty much anything I want to. And so uh, that certainly includes uh, IIS Manager and such. Which am I finding? Oh, there, sorry, <laughs> I put just my desktop. Right there. So there we are, and so we can actually see. Okay, this is the actual name of the machine. It's assigned by the uh, by the data center, and we have a site set up. It's a web role site, and if I had more time and inclination, I could. I can do anything I wanted to. I can set up uh, additional uh, virtual directories and applications. I could set up uh, the exact configuration I want. All the things that I really couldn't do in the past um, when I was restricted to a narrow, narrow, narrow mode of running. So, uh, 
opens up lots of new scenarios. So enough of that. Let us move on. Another feature that's very exciting, um, and this isn't a CTP feature, so you have to sign up for it, is the low-cost compute instance. So in the past, we've had uh, four VM sizes, small, medium, large, and extra large. Um, they give you certain different, different amounts of uh, CPU power, local storage, and uh, some memory. Uh, and they were starting at 12 cents, uh, 12 cents an hour and doubling as you went larger and larger, so 12, 24, and so on. Uh, now we have this low-cost compute instance at only 5 cents an hour. And uh, not, not changing any of their options. This is a new option coming alongside the other four sizes. Uh, this is low performance in I.O., so why would you want to use it? Well, it's really meant for applications that maybe use only occasionally or have a very light load and minimal I.O. needs, or perhaps uh, for development testing, so that's where you don't want to, uh, you want to keep the cost down. So here you can see the specs. So an extra small has a, a 1.0 gigahertz CPU. It's got 768 megabytes of memory. 20 gigabytes of local instant storage, low I/O performance, but it's less than half the cost of the uh, the small size we had traditionally. So to show what that's like, I actually don't have my CTP uh, acceptance yet, so I can't actually show you this in the cloud. But I can show you what it's like to uh, specify it. So go to my sample application here. And if I, uh, if I look at my cloud service definition, my CSDF file, for my web role, as you know, I can set my, my VM size. And so you'll see here in the IntelliSense that extra small is a new choice. So that would be one way of doing it. The other way would be to go to my role, right click, role properties. And there's your choice right there in the GUI. So, uh, no rocket science at all to set up, just something you ask for. Uh, but again, you do need to be in the CPT so you uh, have access to the feature. If you're not, if you're on the CPT and you try to upload the uh, extra small, then you would uh, you would get a refusal to deploy. Okay, so here's one that uh, that we'll cover in our second webcast series. We've had the SQL Azure database. Now we have SQL Azure reporting services becoming available. Uh, so largely the same experience as SQL Server reporting services, if used to that. Uh, but this is running in the cloud. It's running against your SQL Azure databases. And so, uh, again, as you might be used to already with SSRS, you use Business Intelligence Design Studio, which is uh, kind of a, an offshoot of Visual Studio, to set up and test your reports. And uh, again, as of SSRS, you might use various viewer controls to uh, to render your reports and things like web pages. So you know, the big story here is it's very familiar if you've already used SSRS. But uh, the exciting part of it, it's a service in the cloud you can use and runs against your SQL Azure databases. And there's Azure Connect, another one that we won't show today because we uh, aren't in the CTP yet, but we'll show in, in one of the uh, subsequent two webcasts. This is also a pretty important feature. Windows Azure Connect is, uh, is the first wave in, a, in, a, in an overall banner offering called Windows Azure Virtual Network. And what this does is it creates a network bridge, a virtual network connection between your local machines and your Azure uh, computer instances. So, for example, I could have a, uh, an app in the cloud that wants to use my local SQL Server database. And I don't, let's say, it, or maybe it's not even SQL, maybe it's Oracle or MySQL or something else. Uh, and also, you, you can't or don't want to move that database to the cloud, but you want your application to be in the cloud. Well, in the past, your options have been some kind of elaborate sync or building a whole new web services layer, something like that, uh, changing your data access methodologies. Um, but what if you just want to use that app that always has worked and, uh, and do it pretty painlessly? Well, with Windows Azure Connect, you, what you do here is you create um, what are called role groups. You indicate one or more of your cloud roles of your solution are going to be part of this uh, virtual network. Uh, when you say, when I say role, every instance that a role is automatically included. So if you add and remove roles, uh, instances rather to a role, that you automatically have membership. So it's the role that has the membership. And you can define machine groups. These are machines you identify on your, on your local area network. And then you, uh, with these role groups and machine groups defined, you create virtual networks that, that include uh, one or more of these. You can, uh, so you authorize how these groups can be connected. 
in, the, in a role group, uh, which are, you know, instances in the cloud, these instances are not allowed to see each other. There's strict isolation in the cloud, and that's, that still holds true. But in the, in, the, um, in the machine groups, it's an option you can set. So if you had several of your uh, local area network machines in a machine group in a, in a, in a virtual network, uh, they, whether they can see each other or not is an option that you can set and control. Well, all of this is defined in the portal, and uh, there is a, an installation agent that you need to install on your local machines. Uh, so the best way to get the appreciation for this is, is, is uh, upcoming with the Windows Azure training kit. It's a lab on uh, Windows Azure Connect, and uh, again, you do need CTP membership in order to uh, see it. Uh, one of the reasons this is such an exciting feature is uh, some scenarios that have been a little hard for cloud or expensive for cloud have been uh, one of them is what I call the molar pattern. Uh, just imagine an application in the on-premise that has a lot of integrations through general systems. Uh, you can liken that to a, to a tooth with a lot of deep roots that would be hard to extract out of the enterprise or expensive to, to, uh, to move to the cloud because you'd have to wire up that access amount to all of those systems. Uh, but with Windows Azure Connect, it's, a, it's an easy, simple scenario. Suddenly, uh, uh, direct access can be maintained. Yet you're not exposing anything on your network to the outside world. It's, uh, it's all done with a very... Uh, trustworthy technology of VPN. App Fabric Cache Service. So uh, if you're familiar with, with App Fabric, there have been uh, two ver variations of it, the, uh, the Windows Server version for the enterprise and the Windows Azure version for the cloud. Uh, and if you've kept up with it, you've, you've probably realized that the, uh, the features in one don't mirror the features of the other. So in Windows Server App Fabric for the enterprise, we've had features like uh, uh, Good container hosting for WCF and WF services. We've had the velocity distributed cat memory cache. Uh, but over in the cloud, the, the feature set has been equally important but different. We've had the service bus, post scrub communication through the cloud that tunnels well through uh, NASA of firewalls. We've had the access control service for federated security supporting the world's security systems. Uh, and Microsoft has hinted uh, throughout the year that uh, it's not an accident that they both have the name of fabric and that some convergence is in view here over time. Uh, so the first evidence of that is the uh, the new App Fabric Cache Service. So here in the cloud, we've had a feature that previously we only had in Windows Server App Fabric. Uh, so this really is uh, the same feature as uh, the velocity distributed cache in the enterprise from the standpoint of you're using it. It is uh, got the same API, used it the same way, and the uses for it would be things like session state or any kind of data caching your application uh, wants to do in memory. So this feature has a lot of people excited, but, but needs to be understood in proper context, it's called VM role. Now, roles are a term for the, uh, the container, the sort of the design pattern for hosting your applications and what is Azure Compute Services. And until now, we've been we've had two general types of container. We've had the uh, the web role and the worker role. The web role has been for HTTP endpoint load balance traffic, so really good for websites, satellite applications, WCF web services. And the work role has been really for everything else, so batch programs, things that you would only put in a Windows Control Panel service, uh, or things that need something of an HTTP to communicate with, like uh, like a WCS service that uses TCP. So the web role and the work role have been our standbys all along, and they will continue to be. But there's been there's been need to support other other scenarios. Um, I already mentioned the scenario earlier that was problematic, which is installing third-party software or doing things to registry, and, and we have the the, uh, the admin mode startup task feature we looked at earlier, which addresses a lot of that, but it doesn't always uh, uh, take care of things. The uh, You might have installation that's just a total interactive thing, or it takes a long time, and uh, that probably will not work with the admin mode startup task, so the VM role is, uh, is recommended with that scenario in particular. But this is more uh, getting away from the, uh, the Windows Azure target is platform as a service where everything you use is very scalable and redundant and protected and managed for you. And this goes more to the realm of uh, infrastructure as a service. And in that world, it's more like traditional hosting. It's more like uh, traditional uh, access to a computer. You're, you're in charge of more things. Um, you may see it as good or bad, but, for example, you don't get the health monitoring or the automatic patching that you would get with the web world and worker role. So it's, it's important to understand that you're giving up a lot when you use this feature. Uh, the way you use it, and again, we'll be demonstrating this in one of the other uh, parts of this webcast, is uh, you create a uh, uh, some VM based on Windows Server 2008. Uh, there aren't any licensing issues with that because it becomes Windows Server 2008 enterprise uh, when it goes to the cloud anyway. Uh, you do have to install something on the VM called Windows Azure Components. 
Um, the way you deploy is you upload your, uh, a VHD file to, um, to create, typically we create this with Hyper-V. Uh, you upload a VHD to uh, blob storage, and uh, and you can select the uh, the VHD blob storage to be deployed to your, to your instances. Uh, one nice thing is for updates, you can upload a diff VHD. And VHD is going to be pretty large, but for updates, you can upload a diff VHD. You can change just the differences, and you can save a little bit on the, uh, the time of storage uh, in that scenario. So again, something you have to be in CTP to get. Uh, and the third part of this webcast series will show you VMworld. Okay, so um, there were sessions at PDC on many of these new features. And uh, all of those sessions, those videos are online. So if you go to MicrosoftPDC.com, and if you weren't at PDC a month ago where these were announced and discussed, you can, you can watch the keynotes, you can watch the session videos, you can download the session presentations. Also, there was an update to the Windows Azure Platform Training Kit, a uh, November update that just came out, at you know, com in the developer area. And that's uh, that's been updated for the 1.3 SDK. And uh, keep your eye out for subsequent updates to that, which will uh, uh, give you, show you, uh, start to include LAS for a lot of these new features. So definitely, uh, definitely a resource you want to leverage. So in summary then, We've looked at, uh, we have a, a new 1.3 SDK app, which has uh, a new tools for Visual Studio. Uh, we, we, uh, we suggested if you're upgrading something to that, that you look at that carefully just to make sure you don't have any uh, any impact. Uh, new portal is a huge new feature and enabler for some of these other features. Uh, intuitive to use, but different. You have the option of using the new or the old portal. Uh, admin mode startup tasks will allow you to install third-party software. To register comp components, update the registry and such. Uh, it widens the number of scenarios that are uh, that are usable for web and worker roles. Remote desktop, huge for debugging or just even uh, learning about the cloud environment. Uh, it allows you to get in there and uh, and really uh, touch the machine much more directly than has been available in the past. It should make a big difference in the uh, in the management and uh, particularly the diagnostic experience. Full IIS, now you can get in there and add uh, additional uh, virtual directories, configure the features exactly the way you want, and uh, inspect what's going on, and just, uh, uh, I, again, not feel that the cloud is narrowing the options you had used during the enterprise. So we have much more parity now. Low-cost computing instance VM size, five cents, five cents an hour. Um, limited machine, but certain scenarios a good fit, perhaps uh, develop for development as well as for uh, little-used applications. And again, those last two, uh, full IIS and uh, low-cost uh, instances open up a lot more scenarios, uh, especially on the, on, the, for the, on the low end, where uh, the, the pricing model might have been a little prohibitive, prohibitive for a single application, but now between the, uh, between the full IIS, where you can share apps on the same farm, and the low-cost size, um, a, much wide, a much broader set of, 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 uh, of low-end uh, scenarios should make, should make financial sense on, on the platform now. SQL Azure Reporting Services, we will look at that next time and take you through it. Windows Azure Connect is a virtual uh, network capability. We will uh, we will demo that to you in, uh, in one of the subsequent uh, installations of this webcast. Likewise with the uh, cache service, um, which is a feature finally from uh, crossing over from the Windows Server app fabric into the cloud. VMRoll will demonstrate that in the third part of this webcast. Um, more of a infrastructure as a service play, um, good for certain scenarios. Uh, Never recommend it as, as your uh, plan A, though. Uh, it, it is a uh, site class way of running a cloud. You don't get all of the uh, great benefits of the cloud, like going many patching when you use the VMworld you know, feature. One thing I didn't mention, but along with the uh, the new SDKs and Tools Visual Studio, uh, there is updated support for uh, Java and Eclipse, um, including real good support for uh, Java runtime packages like Tomcat and such. So if you if you uh, play it in that world, it's something you'll want to uh, find out more about. There was a great session on it at the uh, for PDC. Okay, that is it for the uh, the formal things I wanted to uh, talk about and show you, and uh, we can now take questions. Thank you, Dave, for this awesome presentation. We did have a question come through, and this is a reminder to everybody to ask the question. Click on the Q and A verbiage located in the toolbar on the top left side of your screen. Type your question, and then click the Ask button. One of the questions that came through was. What is the maximum number of co-administrators allowed? 
Uh, great question. I don't know the answer to it. What is the maximum number of commitments traders allowed? Um, but, you know, I, just don't know. I, I, uh, I have this question I should have prepared for, but I just don't know. I haven't, uh, I haven't exercised the limit there. But, yeah, uh, I imagine the future would be too useful if you couldn't have at least, uh, I would imagine you could have, uh, you know, somewhere between half a dozen or a dozen. Uh, or, or I'm not sure where they would, where they, they would have the future. But uh, I'll, I'll see if I can find out. And if I do find out, I'll post the answer on my, on my blog. Thanks, David. Another question was, can we establish communication between Azure roles under different subscriptions, subscription accounts using Azure Connect? Uh, yes and no. Uh, so your question is, if I have uh, several Azure roles that I want to uh, make part of the same virtual network, and some of those are in different subscriptions, can I can I unite all of that? That's a good question. I'm going to uh, I'm going to uh, postulate that the answer is no, for the simple reason that the way you set up these virtual networks is in the portal, and the portal is showing you. Now the portal has a lot more parallelism, parallelism than it used to. Um, but when you set up these uh, networks, you're, you know, it's kind of uh, letting you pick from your uh, machine groups and uh, Azure groups, I think, that's on the same subscription. So uh, another question that I don't know the answer to, because these features we've only had, you know, this week in the case of CDP ones, we haven't even had them directly to play with yet. So it's new to all of us. Um, that might be a barrier. I'm not sure that the portal will let you uh, span uh, subscriptions. But, uh, but I'm not sure. So another thing I'll blog about if I can find the answer. Thanks, David. Another question. Same VMM sizes, extra small to extra large, apply for VM roles as well? Yes. So those sizes are uh, available for any of your roles. All right. Thank you. Another question was, what is the map? Oh, ask that question. I'm so sorry. I heard that some of these features are not available yet. That's right. So as we've uh, as we sort of mentioned, uh, some of these you, uh, you can use now. It's something you have to kind of set up for. So let me kind of uh, try to uh, enumerate that. So the new SDK and Tools Visual Studio you can get now. The new portal is obviously up and live now, although, although the old portal is still available. Uh, admin mode startup tasks uh, you should be able to do right now. Remote desktop as I demoed you can do right now. Full IS you can do right now. The low cost compute size, this is the extra small instance that you do need to be in a CTP to use. SQL Azure reporting services, you need to be in a CTP to use. Windows Azure Connect, you need to be in a CTP to use. App Robert Cache Service, you can use, but um, it's in a uh, it's in a, uh, a, a sort of a trial. So uh, when you, if you if you go on the Magic Portal to the cache area, it'll it'll give you a link to the App Fabric Labs area. That's a sort of a test area that the App Fabric team has, um, and it's from there that you'll be able to enable the cache service and use it. It's currently available as a, as a beta, um, which means you can, for the time being you can use it without charge. VM role, you have to sign up for the CTP, and again, if you go into these areas of the portal, it'll, it'll tell you that. And the uh, Java Eclipse SDK, I am not sure if that's been released yet or if that's about to come out, but uh, it's, if, not, if it's not out yet, I'm, uh, it's certainly imminent. Thanks, David. If anyone has any more questions, please feel free to type them at this time. In the meantime, I'm going to click through a few polling questions, and we greatly appreciate your feedback. First question, was this content helpful for your business? Yes or no? Give a few more seconds for everybody. Great, thank you. Second question. Please write the presentation content. Excellent, good, or poor? Great. Thank you, everybody. Last polling question. Would you like us to schedule a follow-up? Yes or no? a few more seconds for everyone. Great, thank you. If there are no further questions, we'd like to thank David again for this wonderful presentation. This webcast is a part of our What's New from PVC series. 
will be hosting the next webcast, What's New from PDC Part 2, SQL Azure Windows Azure VM Roles, on December 15th. We will be finding out more information about this webcast along with the recorded version of the presentation. If you have any further questions about this presentation, please feel free to email David. And David, do you have your email address anywhere that you could pull up for the audience? Well, you, people can just email me through my blog. That's the easiest thing. I have one thing to remember. So, uh, David Palmer at blogspot.com. Uh, sorry, dot blogspot.com. And you can, uh, you can send me messages that way. Thanks, David. Again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you on our next webcast. You are now free to disconnect. Thank you.